All right, well, welcome to physical weathering. It's our second video when we're looking at weathering. Um, and today we're going to be looking at what is this thing called physical weathering. Right? And so I think today you're going to feel the power of the water side. Well, let me try that again. Feel the power of the water side. All right, so what are we going to do today? Well, we're going to do three things. We're going to start off, we're going to do a really quick review on what is weathering. It's not as a target, but you'll see. We're going to compare and contrast what is physical and chemical weathering. We're going to identify major causes of physical weathering. And we're going to identify the role that water has in physical weathering. So let's go. Well, on our last video, we went and we found a definition of weathering. And we said that weathering is the process of breaking up rocks into smaller pieces. And that breaking up uh, this process is really just an action. Something's happening to change rocks from big rocks to little rocks, to taking them off a cliff, to taking them to sand on your beach. And we use this term sediment. That sediment is just small pieces of rock. It could be anything from a boulder all the way down smaller to clay. They're all pieces of what we would call sediment. And I asked you to do this. I asked you to be evil, and you did. We came up with a great job. We did lots of things to those poor rocks. We put them in explosions. We grinded them. We, well, we ground them. We had grinding. There was crushing and smashing and cracking and melting. We had acids. We put them under animals. We rusted them in corrosion. And we had water. Well, we had a great list. And there was a lot more. I wish I could put even more up there. But we did a great job. Let's get physical today. Let's look at physical weathering. Physical weathering is, by definition, breaking down rocks into smaller pieces. Mm, wait a second, isn't that just what weathering is? Yeah, but we're going to add something on. In fact, if you look in the book, it is without changing the rock. It means that the rock is still the same rock, it's just smaller. Right? So if you started off with a giant piece of granite, and you put it in some type of weathering device that you're going to weather it, and you came out with little pebbles of granite, it's still granite. You just physically weathered it. That's very different from chemical weathering, which you're gonna to see to the next one that is actually changing what's inside the rock to make it smaller. Sometimes if you're reading in a textbook or you're reading on the internet, you might see it called mechanical weathering. And it's the same thing, um, it just changing the word from physical to mechanical. Um, but I prefer to use the word physical weathering because it's much more descriptive. I think you can re-look at it and really quick figure out that you're physically changing the rock. So make sure you understand that physical weathering, the rocks are smaller, but they have the same material, right? So physical weathering rocks made the same stuff, just smaller. And chemical weathering, the stuff has been changed and they're still smaller, all right? They're really just that little difference that makes a really large change in the end. All right, so let's look at some physical weathering. This is from right one of my favorite movies that you could probably already tell. It's Star Wars, right? Episode four, where the Death Star under Darth Vader is coming and he's trying to crush the rebel base on Alderaan. And he uses the full power of the dark side and the Death Star and it blows up Alderaan. And it's this giant explosion and, right? Well, really, if you wanted to be really geeky and nerdy, as we all do, you could really say that the Death Star really just weathered Alderaan. Right? It broke it up. It was one giant rocky planet and turned it into a bunch of small little space bits that went flying out through the universe. It's weathered. Smaller pieces, right? Still the same. It's physical weathering. Well, as far as that's cool, and I'm sure if you try to say that at some science fiction con uh, convention, you might be in a little bit of trouble. But let's look at how actually physical weathering is happening on our planet. And we're going to start with us, humans, right? We're physically weathering our planet. In fact, when our list of being evil, almost all the stuff we came up with were ways that we could do to rocks. Right? We could put them in explosions. We could do. We could grind them in a grinder. We have lots and tons of stuff that we could do. Well, there's actually ways that we are purposely weathering rocks, right? Other than just driving around and smashing them and doing other things, right? We might. We are purposely taking rocks and taking them out of the earth and making them smaller and using them for our own purposes. Right around here in Sandy, one of the big things is Gold Rush. These guys from Sandy that are going up there, and I had some chance to talk with one of them and, and and talk about how they're using minerals and weathering to get rocks and getting gold out of the ground. It's weathering. It's physically weathering. We're taking big rocks. In this case, in the other one, you have Kennecut Mines over in Utah, where it's a giant mountain that they've now just drilled into and taken out little bits of copper, and it's weathering. It's physical weathering. 
other types, there's plants. Plants are actually, trees are really great at physically weathering. If you live in a city, you can walk on the sidewalks and sometimes you might come, a piece of, come across a piece of sidewalk that's been bent or it's out of shape. All that's happening here is a tree root is actually pushing and breaking that sidewalk up, right? But that could happen to rock trees in the forest, can break rocks open and a different plant can come and kind of break them apart with their roots. They get into cracks and are able to push them apart. Animals also do physical weathering. Moles and voles, right, in your garden or your yard, they're digging and they might dig up rocks and put them up on the surface where they could get chemically or physically eroded or even by them digging and scraping, they could be physically eroded, right? Earthworms are taking rocks and eating them and making them smaller in their stomachs and moving them out. Right? These are all types of physical weathering where you have plants and animals and humans. There's other types I don't have slides for but are really minor. The sun can heat up one side of rock and it actually cracks it and cracks it in half. That's physical weathering. Uh, wind can actually come and move rocks and make them and make them smaller. But really, the vast majority of the erosion, or I take it back, the weathering, we'll get to erosion later, that's happening on our planet is by the power of water, right? When we looked at uh, Carl Sagan, we saw his pale blue dot, and we're the pale blue dot because 70% of our planet is covered in this giant ocean, right? Or the water planet, really. And I happen to find on the internet, and you can believe it or not, I don't know yet about our number, it, but 37.5 million billions of gallons of water are in our atmosphere. That's a lot of water. And it's really nothing compared to the amount of water that's over in our oceans. Our oceans are huge. All that water, it really is, plays a very major role on our planet. Right? We have all three stages, solid, liquid, and gas. Water also has a really unique power that isn't pretty special for in the universe. When water freezes, it actually expands. Most liquids don't do that. When you freeze them, they get smaller, the atoms don't move as much, and they can become more dense, and they might sink. But not water, right? When you have a nice, it's a hot day, and you have a nice cold glass of water, and you put some ice cubes in it, the ice floats at the top. It's less dense. It's expanded. And that makes a really big difference when it comes to weathering. So let's look at water as it's frozen in ice, right? Two major ways that this water on our planet can, can be doing weathering is when glaciers end this thing called freeze thaw. Glaciers are really, I like to think as nature's buzz saws. They come and they just cut straight lines and cut lines in our planet, right? This ice is grinding up rocks and leaves behind valleys and um, fjords and uh, moraines at the bottom, these giant piles of rocks they call glacial till. And all it is is just weathered rocks. It's the mountain that's been broken up into little pieces and thrown at the bottom of the glacier. So in these areas, the glaciers are causing major sources of weathering. Another way, which is much more common in Sandy in Oregon, um, is called freeze-thaw. And freeze-thaw is when you have a rock and it might have a small crack in it, most rocks do at some point, water can get inside there. And because when water expands, when it freezes, when winter comes, that water expands and it pushes against the rock, which opens the crack a little bit more. So the next spring comes and more water fills in the summer and fall. And when the winter comes back, there's more water inside that crack. And the crack opens wider, which now allows more water. And over time, that action of putting water inside a crack, having expand, it actually can break a rock apart. You can see in this picture, we have a boulder that's been broken in half. Um, that's actually why you have so many rocks that come off of like Mount Hood, right? Water is getting in cracks, it's breaking it open. When it freezes, it's expanding, and it's called freeze-thaw, and the rocks fall apart. You can also see this in the winter. Sometimes you might look at a soil, and you'll notice that the soil has like ice crystals, and the soil has been lifted up. Well, that's because that water is expanded, and the soil is separated, right? So weathering is just simply from freeze thaw is simply that water expanding and pushing a rock open. And a lot of the same way a plant does it. Well, most water on our planet isn't frozen and it's still going to be doing some physical weathering. For instance, a lot of it is liquid. And liquid water does a lot through what's a process called abrasion. And you don't have to know exactly that term abrasion, but I do want you to understand how liquid water is going to be doing weathering. 
right? Here's a picture on the left, or it might be your right. It's a picture of the Sandy River. And you can see over here that we've got all these nice smooth rocks. It's cut into a valley. And all of that is due to weathering. In the water, in the river, it's carrying little bits of rock already weathered. Could be from the rock falling off from freeze thaw. It could be from the glacial tills, from the glaciers that are on Mount Hood. Anyways, it doesn't matter. And when that water comes through with all those little bits, it's like a sandblaster. And it's blasting away at the rock. And it's carving it and making it into nice and round. And when it makes it round, it's tear tearing off little bits of rock from the other rocks and making more sand for it to blast. So it's kind of this process. So the more rock is in a river, the rounder it gets. So our physical weathering, you could tell when you go up towards the start of a river, the rocks might be bigger, maybe a little bit more jagged. And as you go further down the river, closer to the ocean, they become smoother and smaller. And eventually they become silts and clays and they're just little microscopic nothings that are almost perfectly round. Right? But really, it's all this process of abrasion. A lot of people, for some reason, think that when water does weathering, it's because the water's hitting the rock. Well, that's not exactly it. I mean, if that was the case, you'd have to worry about weathering in your bathtub. No, what's actually happening, what's actually causing the weathering is the little bits of material inside the water that's moving really fast, right? That's what's abrasion. Um, water isn't the only thing that can do abrasion. Wind can too, and if you've ever had the chance to go to like Zion National Park or Arches or Grand Canyon or Canyonlands or Bryce or really any of the national parks that are down in southern Utah, you can see where the rocks have been shaped and, and really molded, and that's all by abrasion with the wind. There's some water thrown in there, but a lot of it is from the wind. So liquid water is sh shaping a lot of our rocks. In fact, most of the weathering that's occurring on our planet is occurring because of liquid water breaking rocks up into smaller and smaller pieces. Well, all rivers lead to the ocean, and if we're trying to figure out how the Earth is recycling all its material, all the weathering um, that's happening and carried down in the water are getting carried out to the ocean, which at some points is going to be back and subducted, and you're getting that recycling, right? So it's really important as we're talking about weathering to remember how this all fits into how the Earth is recycling and maintaining material that we've talked about in plate tectonics and volcanoes and subduction, right? It's all this big process. All right, so let's kind of review what we talked about today, right? We compared and contrast physical and chemical weathering. We said physical weathering is keeping the rocks made of the same material, but just changing the size of them. Where chemical weathering, as we'll see more in the next video, is taking and changing the material inside the rock that will make them smaller. We identified major causes for physical weathering. We said things like humans and animals and plants, sometimes even the sun or wind, but definitely water, lots of water doing things like glaciers and freeze thaw and abrasion like it's happening in a river. And we saw that water plays a huge role in physical weathering. In fact, it's the big thing that's causing physical weathering. So what do I want from you to class? Well, when you come to class tomorrow, I want you to be able to think about what would it be like for the rock to be physically weathered? Put yourself in the rock's shoes. Does it feel good to be weathered? Do you want to be weathered? Why? Why not? We're gonna talk more about that when you come. Now, if you have more questions, or maybe this video isn't quite understanding and I went really fast, watch it again, review it, till it really makes sense and you can really understand what other types of physical weathering and what's it going to do. In our next video, we're gonna look again at chemical weathering and we're gonna compare more and more of those and you're gonna be able to see how do they relate to each other, all right? So, remember, as you keep going, just keep moving forward and I will see you next time.